how to do today. We thank you for your word that never go dull and for your kingdom that live forever. Lord, the hour has come once again to dine in your presence, to know what you have to teach and to guide you. Oh Lord, we ask the help of your Holy Spirit to guide and to direct us, to lead us to all truth. Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. There is pressure, even life forevermore. There is no searching of your understanding. Lord, your paths are past finding out. There is no one that can deliver from your hands. You are the Lord, and that is your name. Your glory cannot be given to others, nor will your praise be given to demons. Lord, we ask for your grace in this time of need. We ask for your wisdom to guide us into all truths, to lead us in the path of holiness, righteousness, and glory. Lord, the hour has come that your name must be glorified. That your sons must possess their possession. O oh Lord, you told me in your word that the just shall live by faith. That if any my heart is lifted up, it has no pleasure in you. Father Lord, the hour has come. Glorify your name. Put your enemy to perpetual shame. O oh Lord, disappoint the device of the wicked. You are the one who will speak to us today. And make known to us your word and guide us with your understanding that in everything your name alone will be glorified father lord today we commit the people of god into your hands as many that will partake in this fellowship even for as many that are in their respective home worship we ask so lord your grace be sufficient for them that your grace be made perfect in their weaknesses Lord, that you make your name known in their hearts. That your glory be shared abroad in every area of their soul. So that in everything, only your name can be glorified. Today, brethren, you are welcome to this Open Heart Fellowship where we use our opportunity to dive into what the Holy Spirit has to share with us every day. Sunday by 5 p.m. Today we have a special message from God that is that we touch your every part of your life and brings the gospel of God to the forefront of your imagination. Today is another day, a day that the Lord rose from the dead, the first day of the week. A day the Lord has made that we should rejoice and be glad in. And as we celebrate with other saints, I'm happy to explain to you today what word the Lord has in store for every one of us. And his words are meant to guide us, to direct us, to instruct us, to teach us what we need to do so that we don't make mistakes. That is what his word is meant for. Today we have a lot to share with you. Our topic is faith that speaks. Faith that speaks. There is faith, but it is faith that speaks loud. Faith that people can see and believe in. Faith that will not be questioned irrespective of what the enemy says. And that is the faith that speaks. And that is what we have in store for you today. It's not any other topic than the topic of faith that is able to speak in the life of a believer. And bring the hidden things to light. And this faith was first demonstrated by Christ himself. And since then, it has been shown in the life of those that loved him. This faith is what you and I call strong faith. 
faith that does not doubt what God has in store for us. He doesn't care what the enemy says, but he speaks aloud. He speaks in difficult times. And when darkness comes, he is not afraid to take the stand with the light. This type of faith is a faith that is unique in the life of a believer. The apostles cited this faith themselves, and the Bible said they were astonished. Because this kind of faith cannot easily be won through vision or by watching other people preach. It comes from the conviction you have on the inside. And this faith, because this kind of cause brings to light the living word of God in the life of a believer and strengthens Christian's welfare. That is the faith that speaks in a blanket space and bring the hidden word of God to the lamb light. That is what we have in store for you today. Brethren, before we go further, I want to take us to the scripture. In the book of Mighty, in the book of Mighty chapter 8, from verse 7. What did he say? He said, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And to have the background of what Jesus was speaking about here, this is a centurious man, a Roman soldier, who has so many servants and soldiers under his control. But he came to Christ. Because his servant was sick, not his sons, not his wife, not him himself, but one of his servants. Though he has a lot of people under his control, he cares about the least in his household. He did not discuss the issue of the sickness of his servant as a minor thing and say well he's a servant if he die I can easily get another one to replace him that would be the taking of people in his time but not this man he stood up knew his servant was sick he knew that this was not a kind of sickness he can go to the daughter for a cure but he decided to go for him hey, in the hand of a minister. And strange enough, this man was not even a Jew. He was one of the Roman legions. A centurion. A centurion means a man in charge of a hundred soldier. He has hundred soldier under his command. He humbled himself. He did not send one of his soldiers to go and bring Christ to him. If he doesn't want to come to you, use force. Bring him, tell him to come and ham, heal my servant. That was not what he did. He went straight to Christ in humility. Today we have a lot of people that are so rich. They don't need to even come to church. All they need to do is to look for the most popular pastor of their choice. Give him a call. And the pastor doesn't even care to know what leads to the situation. All he needs to do is go to the mat in three days, three times a week, and begin to pray for what he doesn't know how it started. And begin to do fasting. While the man is sleeping in his mansion, he has people that he paid to fast for him. He has people that he paid to pray on his behalf. He even have those who he prayed to go to heaven on, their, on his behalf. And those he paid to descend into hell. And raise Christ off on the grave so that he can come and fix his problem. 
That is what our rich men of today will do. They don't need to call, come to the man of God in humility. The politician just simply to send for the pastor or use his church as a campaign venue during an election. But that was not what Christ did. He knew that Christ was not that kind of a political pastor. He knew who he was. Because his faith speaks on his behalf. And I want you to understand something strange from his empire. And from this time in history, there was no radio. There was no TV. I doubt if there was even any newspaper. How did this man get to know about Christ? Because his faith speaks. Today, Christians are struggling to be in the internet so that people can see their face. Some are struggling to be on the TV so that they can have viewers. But that was not Christ. Christ was in an isolated place. He grew up in the home of a capital. He was in the farthest parts of a small, less of a small village in Capano. But something draw people to Christ. And I will tell you what it is. The Bible says, if you lift God on high, he will draw all men to himself. It is not your job to draw people to God. Oh, if I can just have about a million dollars, everybody will come around to worship God. No. You can have a million dollars, only you and butterfly will worship in your church. For people to come to you from everywhere, like they come to Christ, something must attract them. The Bible says where the body is, the egos will gather. The egos does not gather except there is a dead body. And for there, people to gather to you, there has to be something motivating them. Something drawing them to you from everywhere. And today we are going to look into that thing. That is the faith that speaks. Faith. Not just having faith. No. Faith that will speak aloud. I remember when we went for mission. When I, and the pastor spent the whole time complaining to me about how people don't like to come to church. I said there is a feast or something special in the church. I begin to explain to him that even if you cook and put it in the streets, it is only the poor and those that are hungry that will come to eat. People, they will still not come to church. The day the food has stopped, stopped, that is the day they stop your church. And while we're discussing it, somebody called out and said, somebody will set on an error of fainted. And we walked straight there, seeing the guy on the, street, on the bare floor, barely breathing. Life has gone out of him. And the pastor and everybody around were afraid. And there were many spectators who came to watch him, how people died. Not to save him, not to call the daughter for emergency. And I doubt if there was even money available to call the daughter. But they were there to watch him die. But God did something. God took him by the hands and he stand up. And he was healthy. In the evening, the church that the pastor complained that people don't come to church and said he see food was filled up. How did it happen? Because faith speaks. It takes God to do something marvelous in the light of people, to draw people. A brother came to me when I was still in Africa on mission. He said, how do I make my church full so that I can begin to have three service every Sunday? I said, simple. Declare that today is a mad people day. Bring all the mad people in your streets to your church. Heal all of them. And the next Sunday, you'll be holding four service. 
He said that is that will take a, a large kind of faith. I said no. You take faith as small as a grain of sand. I said speak the word, and God will put power in your word, and He will bring people from everywhere to you. And He who speaks the word will not want His name to fall to the ground. He will confirm His word. And every word that comes from your mouth, he will honor it. He said, but I'm afraid. I said, that is where the death comes in. Because fear brings torment and bring war. All you need to do is speak the word. And that is exactly what we are about to find out in the scriptures. Before we go to the word of God, I want us to bow our head gently in a word of prayer. Say, Holy Spirit, take charge. Holy Spirit, take charge over to this message and speak to your people in Jesus' name. Today is another exciting day. I'm very happy to dive into it. Let's start from verse 5 to understand what happened that leads to such word. And when Jesus came into Campania, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servants lieth at home sick of palsy. And there are many of us who understand what palsy is. It's not a disease that can be taken to medical hospital and doctor will tell you here is the cure. No. But the servant was sick of it. And there must be cure somewhere. And the man was ready to seek for that help. He did not abandon his servant, but he was ready to look for help. Miracles start from seeking for it. Many Christians have problems. They keep it under the rock. They say the pastor is, is really a child of God that claims to know what God is saying. He should know what my problem is. I'm sorry to tell you, even if he know, he will not pray for you. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes from the word of God. If you don't test somebody your problem, they will not know how to solve it. And even if you know how to solve it, he will never tell you because you will become a busybody in another man's matter. People can only be saved when they ask to be saved. The first move this man made, faith is not just in word, but in deed. The first thing he understood was to seek for help. That already demonstrated faith. He said, but he didn't have faith or claim in his mouth or confess faith. But what he did is a symbol of faith. He heard the word of God. He decides to look for somebody that has solution. He knew the first key to solving your problem is knowing in the first place there is a problem. But when you don't even know you have a problem as a believer, it will be difficult. Because when the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a ditch. When somebody who has a problem says to somebody else that has another problem, please let me help you. That is a big problem. Because two of them will help themselves into a big hole. Because you have a problem, you have not fixed it. You are telling somebody else, come, I want to help you fix your own. Before you can fix somebody else's problem, fix your own. And the key to fixing your problem is to realize there is one. When you knew what it is, that there is a problem, but you don't still know the identity of the problem, you still cannot fix it. But you know something is wrong. But you cannot just place your hand on what is wrong. That means you are still not in the process of fixing it. But first, you have to identify the disease, or the affliction, or the conflict, or the barrenness, or the frustration, or the poverty in your life. Then can you start looking for the solution? And you wake up, you wonder. Everybody dress up with tie and money, and everybody is heading to work. But you are at home, sitting on your couch. Obviously, you know there is a problem. 
Because if there is no problem, as other people are going to the office, it's supposed to be going to one to. But you just know what the problem is. Because you don't know whether it is your dullness that prevents you from getting a job, or some spiritual hands, or it is just because you're not educated enough, or there is no job available for a person like you. You don't just know. But until you move to the next steps of identifying what the problem is, you're going to put your life down and tabulate it with the life of other people. What do they have that I don't have? How come they are going to job? Are, are they all more intelligent than I am? Are they more, all more better people than I am? And when those questions are answered, it takes you to the next stage. Then how come they are working and I am not? Is it because I didn't look for? Or I haven't submitted application enough? Or because the company just hates me? Or because they refuse to call me? And when you knew that none of those things are true, then that leads you. An enemy has done this. Or is it God's plan for my life? Then that takes you to the scripture, to search the scripture. What did the Bible say concerning this thing? I know God said in the word, I know the thought I think towards you. They are thought of good, not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. So where is my future? By sitting down at home. 24 hours a day without a job. That becomes your question. Then you now take it back to God. And say, God, you said in your word that your will above all things is that I should prosper and be in a good state of health even as my soul prospers. How am I going to prosper if I don't have a job and I don't have money to meet my needs? Now, O oh Lord, I want you to change this situation so that I can fulfill your purpose. That is where faith speaks. First, understand it flows from knowledge. Because without knowledge, faith is dead. Because faith flows from the knowledge that you have with him. And from your understanding, it is elevated and brought to light. But not all knowledge produces faith. Positive knowledge produces faith. Negative knowledge keeps faith. As a believer, the more positive knowledge you allow to flow into you, the more faith is produced in you. But if, for example, instead of thinking about your problem, you start down on that coach with remote control from morning to night and begin to scan all the channel, obviously you forget you have a problem. 20 years, you will be in the problem because you just take your time to scan the channel rather than scan your problem. But what if you take the time to attack other people as the demons that are attacking you rather than fix your own problem? The problem will remain. What if you take the time to blame God and say, God, is because you are very wicked. That's why you give everybody in my streets job except me. Obviously, your problem will remain the way it is. That leads us to the next point. This man understood that his servant has a disease and he even gave it a name. Passing. What if he has called that disease healing? Obviously, the servant would have been healed. But he decided to name it passing. And the disease became passing. So whatever name you give your situation, that is the name it takes. And if you decide to call your stomach ache, stomach ache, it becomes stomach ache. Because your body makes you feel somehow. You gave it a name. It's not your body that gave it a name. 
Oh, you feel you are, you feel something in your head, and you call it headache. And when people ask you what are you feeling, you say I'm feeling headache because you gave it a name. But you can also speak out positivity into that headache. And you can combine the headache to become healing. Who told you you wouldn't listen? He will listen to your voice. You can decide what name you want it to be. Because you will make like God. And you will make in his likeness and after his image. And do you know what God's the Bible says about God? He said, the Lord is the Lord that calleth those things that are not as though they are, and they come to be. Today, you have ability to call those situations that comes from nowhere, that you don't like, that are contrary to your life, contrary to your comfort, contrary to your victory. You can call them new names. And it will come to pass, even according to your word. Today, God has given you authority over situation. I remember a long time ago, my grandma woke up from sleep. And he said he was fainting. Woke up with this terrible sickness. And she was at the point of death. And, I, and he, she, in her frustration, because she never called me for prayer, and when she called me for prayer, I knew something was wrong. That this was a terrible situation. That needed urgent attention. And I walked straight to her. I saw sweats of death. And people were pouring water on her. I said, what happened? He said, my son, I was sleeping. Somebody put a basket on my head with a load on it. He said, I woke up and my body changed. I said, congratulations. Since the sleep brought the sickness, the only way to feel the sickness is to go back to sleep. The people around were looking at me and said, This man is mad. Somebody's at the point of death, you are saying you should go back to sleep. I said, Yes. There is only one way to solve this problem go to sleep. When you see the woman that put load on your head, put the load back on her head. Tomorrow you go to your farm. That is the only prayer you need. He doesn't need prayer. All he needs is to speak to it. Change the assignment. And then, she did exactly as I said. And she woke up the next morning, she went to farm. She forgot she was at the point of death yesterday night. That is faith that speaks. Whatever you say, it will come to pass. If you can only believe that what you say will come to pass. It's a simple load back, but very difficult for some Christian to meet. Speak the word. Believe in it. And watch it come to pass. But, and I must warn you, some things don't just grow up overnight. It takes time to grow. So you need little patience added to your faith. But when your faith lacks patience, your faith dies natural death. So that is why so many Christians say, I don't know. I just pray. God doesn't even hear me. It's like my case is closed. Your case is not closed. You are the one closing your case with your mouth. Your case will be open if you want it to be open. When you use your mouth to close your case, your case will be closed. And the Bible said, as the man speaketh in his heart, so is he. If in your life, the devil tells you you can't make it, you can never make it. And when you, are, you keep saying it to yourself, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. No matter how small they said it back, you will never make it. But God is saying to you today, situation can change. Just like what this man did. Let's read verse 7. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Very strange of Jesus. Many times they call him 
among Gentiles to come and heal the sick. He never went. Even to the other woman, he said it is wrong to give the children food to dogs. But this man called Jesus. He must have respect for the man. Because he cited faith in him. For a centurion to leave his soldier. To leave his bodyguard. He didn't send message to Christ. He came by himself. He showed that he believes in you. There are, for example, there are sickness you are tied to as a minister. Even if you were supposed to go and eat or sleep, somebody knock at your door, you wake up urgently and attend to it. That is when you start faith in the person. When the person believes in you. He didn't call somebody else. He came directly to you. You knew he believes that your God is alive. Because he believes that your God is alive, he will never be disappointed. That was what Jesus saw in him. That's why he did it through test at his sides. He said to the man straight ahead, I will come and heal him. He didn't say to him, you are a Gentile and a Jew. The Jews has no delay with Gentiles. How dare you come to me to come and heal your servant? Don't you know I am a Jewish rabbi? There was no such thing. But he rather humbled himself and said, I will go with you. I will come and heal him. He says, I will come and pray. He said, I will come and heal him. Wow. Strange. Why would he say I will come and heal him? Is he a doctor? Is he a healer? What is he? Why would he say I will come and heal him? Because he never doubts his ability. The grace of God upon his life, he is so sure of it. For a miracle to happen, they have to be faith in both the receiver and the giver. When these two faiths collide, miracles always happen. When there is a deep expectation and the giver is willing to give, there is nothing preventing the receiving. Party from receiving. And that's exactly what Christ did here. Christ was ready to give. On the other hand, the man was ready to receive. But something else happened here that caught Christ's attention. The centurion answered Christ when he said, I will come and heal him in verse 8. And answered, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy. That was when Christ was astonished at his face. I am not worthy. That thou shouldest come under my roof. He is not just a soldier. A man with hundred soldiers. I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Just speak the word. I believe in your God. You don't need you to be present to lay hand on me so that I fall and roll on the ground to believe in you. If you pray over the phone, I believe your God will answer. I believe your God will heal me wherever I am. I don't need to see you face to face. I don't care whether I am in America, you are in Sweden, or I am in Africa, you are in Germany, I don't care. If, I, if you speak the word, your God that can heal where you are can heal me in America. That is the faith. I want you to have today the faith that is able to speak in situation. Faith that speaks and it doesn't care about distance. Faith that creates the foundation of the universe from nothing. That is the faith you need to go through life. Faith that will make you speak to your enemy in the battlefield rather than carrying sword. And they will bow down in obedience to you. That is the faith 
that speaks. This is faith that stand up in time of darkness. And darkness have reverence for it. When you believe in God, all things are possible. That is all God needs from you. He is looking for people who will believe him in their difficult situation. When all hope are gone, he is going to open his mouth and say, I believe. That's all God is looking for. God is not looking for those that will say, I am perished. I am doomed. My days are over. My bones are dry. My visions are gone. No. God is looking for those who believe dry bones can rise again. Who believe difficult situations do not last. Who believe that with God all things are possible. Who believe that the just shall live by faith. That is the people God is looking for. God is not angry that you did not go to the house of the sick to carry him on your hand and begin to pray and speak in tongues you know are the one you do not know. Just believe. I remember the time I tried to heal the sick without first knowing if he even believed in my prayer. It ended up disastrously. I end up praying for two weeks for a problem of two days. And at the end of two weeks, I got nothing. Because the person didn't want the healing. And I was foolish enough to waste two weeks before asking the right question. Christians should learn to ask the right question at the beginning. Faith can be sensed in people. When they come to you for healing, you knew once that this person can be saved. Oh, come to church on Sunday. I will come. You know who is coming. Oh, come, let me pray for you. You know who should, you should lay hand and who you should not. Because your hand is just a waste. We did deliverance for somebody. And we end up doing the deliverance two times. Because he never listened to the instruction of the Lord. Because the demon that left came back with more demons. And they became stronger than the first one. And this time they begin to take life. To dismantle things in the community. And that is when you knew. That your prayer was never heard. And the people never listened. And sometimes. It is difficult as a Christian to believe that your God can supply all your needs. But the truth is, He always. I have served God for 30 years. And for those 30 years, the only time I was disappointed was when I did not ask. That was when I was disappointed. Because that was when I decided I'm going to do it myself. I put, I said, God, leave this one for me. I'm going to fix it myself. It's not very hard. This situation, just give me some time. I will fix it. God will say, okay. I'm giving you all the time. How many years do you need? <laughs> I say, I just need a week. I say, okay, one week then. Fix it. And I go there and messed up. I go there the second day and messed up. For the whole week, instead of fixing the situation, I increased the trouble by a week. And then I realized that I'm not even dust and ashes. Then I bow my knees in humility and say, Father, I'm ashamed. I've messed up. He said, I knew you would mess up. I said, well, why were you watching me? He said, because you said you can fix it. So I was waiting for you to fix it. 
and then I cried to him. He came to my rescue on visit. I remember being sent away from work when I was coming from church on Sunday. People don't work on Sunday, but I was fired on Sunday. Coming from church, singing Amazing Grace, it was a wonderful service. The glory of the Lord was mighty, but before I reached home, I received a call. Please don't come back tomorrow. You have been replaced. <laughs> I say congratulations. God, I went to serve you. I am coming back from your service. Instead of receiving congratulations, you have been promoted. I just received congratulations, you have been fired. And the Lord said, I just promoted you. At that point in time, for two days, I locked myself inside the room in prayer. But I was thinking actually, what is promotion in being sacked? That was my thinking. And I began to sit down and meditate upon the word of God. And after 30 days, the Lord said something to me. Because I employed you. I said, because you employ me, you fired me for my work. He said, yes, I did it. Because sometimes you need to go close so that you can know what God has planned. Because hidden things are left for those that fear the Lord. The Lord we only revealed his secret to those he loves. If you are beloved like Daniel, or beloved like John in the New Testament, God will show you the secret of things to come. Then I asked God one question a long time ago. I said, I have gone to many pastor seminars and teachers who are professors in theology. And when they come to explain the book of Revelation, they all miss it. How come? I was 10 years old. I could decode the entire book of Revelation without looking at any book. He said, because you draw to me and you know the source of the living world. He said, those people wanted to seek knowledge from this book. He said, that's why you don't see many nobles are called. Or many wise men after the flesh are called. But God always chooses the foolish things to confront the wise. He always choose the weak and the fighting to confront the things that are mighty. Because his authority is not in the cloud. When the Ark of the Covenants was brought into the camp of the people of Israel, the Bible said the people shouted, to the earth and heaven responded, and the earth resounded it again. But what followed after was what shocked me. Because whenever you hear but, what calmness is not going to be very good. The Bible said but, it was an empty shout. That's far the sound. You go to some church, the choral start can sing like the angels in heaven. When you hear the sound, you say, God, I just want to make this place my permanent home. I don't, don't let me just leave this church. I want to make this church my home where I stay eat and drink and sleep in. But God, you hear the silent voice from the Holy Spirit. But God is not in this place. God, how come you are not here? That's not all this beautiful song. The voice of the man of God is wonderful. But God is not in the place because sin has entered the camp. Because fear has torments. Fear has wolf. When God said thou sh you should not sin, it's not because of him. It's because of you. Because sin limits your ability. Sin introduces fear. Fear to approach. If you are a faithful wife, when your husband is coming home, you will be happy to embrace him, to welcome him, and to give him one kiss. But what happens if you are an unfaithful wife? 
suddenly your husband just knock, show up at the house without knocking. You are afraid. He may have caught you red-handed. And because of that fear, you begin to shake in the hand and feet. Even if he doesn't know, only your fear will betray you. Because you are unfaithful. And when sin comes into the life of a believer, it makes you an unfaithful wife. And because you are an unfaithful wife to your husband, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, you are afraid to stand in his presence. So you can never combine faith. It doesn't matter what you try to do. It doesn't matter how many hours you pray or how long you spend in his presence. You will never be able to command faith. Because faith comes from a heart full of confidence. So you need this for your faith to speak. Your faith can only speak from a heart that is confident in his God. That trusts his husband. That his husband trusts as well. Because faith works both ways. And you can never ascend in the spirit without faith. That if not, science would have discovered the throne of God by now. Without faith, you cannot see heaven. So no matter how science builds a space rocket, no matter how fast it can go, no matter how many clouds they can break, no matter how big the telescope, you will never see heaven. Because for you to see heaven, you have faith. And without faith, it is impossible to see God. Even if he's sitting down with you. Even if he's carrying you in his hand. Even if he's sleeping on the same bed with you. Even if you can talk to him every time of the day. You will still not be able to see or hear him. Or have any fellowship with him. Because it takes faith to have fellowship. When Adam and Eve were in the garden. In the cool of the evening, the Bible revealed to us that God has fellowship with them. He comes every day to say, Adam, how was your day today? What did you do in the garden? What fruits did you pick? What animals did you name? And what were the names you gave them? That was the closeness they were. But the day Adam disobeyed his maker, they say Adam went to hide. Because the wicked flew when no man pursued him. Before then, Adam was happy to stand in the presence of God. Because the righteous is as bold as a lion. That's why. Oh, why is it that anything you teach, righteousness must come in? Because without holiness, no man can see God. Faith or no faith. Power or no power. You cannot see him. Oh, I just need to believe. If not, motivational, motivational speaker would have been the most faithful people healing the sick, raising the dead. But unfortunately, they can't. All they have is word. Word alone does not produce faith. Because you need holiness. If you must see God, you must, you must enter into His presence. You must enter with a clean hands and a pure heart. You must not think evil against your neighbor. You must forgive all that their trespasses so that he himself can forgive you your own. Because the Lord our God is holy. Nothing unclean can come to his presence. Oh, that's why you see Christians. I have been in the church. This junior pastor was brought from nowhere. And they promoted him from junior pastor. Now he's now the deputy general of Asia. What about me? I have been in the church for 50 years. I have been paying my tithes. I have been devoted, preaching the word of God, season without season. But this man just come. I don't know where he even get his ability from. He was promoted above me. The reason why they promote him is because there is light that shines. And what happened to you? 
The light in you has become darkness. And the Bible says how gross is such a darkness. If the good light that God puts in your life, instead of shining for the world to see, become darkness. Put Christians who are Christian in cage. People will come to them from everywhere in the cage. And in the cage, they will get their healing. In the cage, they will get their deliverance. In the cage, they will come and take him from the cage and put him in the palace. But put unbeliever in the palace who claim to be Christian. They will move from palace to prison. Because people does not come to devil from everywhere. They came to Christ. So let your life shine. That is the key. Because you are the source of the world. You bring taste to the life people live. Those who are frustrated, who feel like taking their own life, who hate themselves, when they come to you, you bring taste into it. When you bring taste into their life, you spear their life from death. But if that salt lost the sweetness or the saltness in it, it is good for nothing. It becomes sand. It does become a white sand that people will match and trample on their feet. Have you ever seen somebody bring sand and say, I want to make soup and pour sand into it and say, this is the salt? No. That is what you have become. People will not use you if you are sand. People will use you if you are salt and you taste well. So if you lost your taste as a salt, you are useless. I don't care the call you have. I don't care the population you have in your church. I don't care the anointing you claim to have before. But now where is it? God is not the God of yesterday. Is the God of today. That's why he said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He never claimed to be the God of the dead. Is the God of the living. The day you die, that is the day God leaves you. Your holiness is no more. Your anointing is no more. You were once healing the sick. You were once raising the dead. That was once long ago. But where is it today? Do you still heal the sick? Do you still raise the dead? Do you still cast out devil? Do you still drive out demons? What happened to the power of God in you? Why did you lost it? Because you welcome in sin. Because sin brings death. It brings spiritual death. It brings physical death. It brings death of the body, death of the spirit, and death of the mind. You become a child of God without confidence. And a child without confidence is not a child, it's a bastard. And God does not look at such children as children. He knew who his children are. They are children that will not lie. Now let's go to what God has to say. And they look at the woman. And when the servant said, just speak a word only. My servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, for I myself, he didn't just stop there. I myself, in verse 9, I am a man under authority. Having soldiers who are under me, I know the issue. I know what command can do. I am not just a soldier, but I am also a man who lives under another commander. But for me, I have servants also who listen to my voice. They don't need me to physically come and move them, but they need to just hear me speak. I am a man 
on that authority, I give a command and people obey. <laughs> oh, I have soldier under me. I said to this man, go. And he goes. And he goes. And to another, come. He comes. And to And to my servant, do this, he doeth it. I give command to my soldiers. And I tell my servant to do anything, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled. He said to them that followed him, Verily I say unto you, I have never found so great a faith, not evil in Israel. I have not seen faith that can speak out. Faith that doesn't wait to be laid hand upon. Faith that doesn't wait for pastor to push his head and shake him very well before it will work. Faith that doesn't wait to be taken up from the wheelchair but jump up himself. Faith that doesn't wait for him to touch his eyes before it is opened. I have never seen such a faith. Faith that just believe because it came from the man of God. He's not waiting for prayer. He just heard by his stripes, you are healed. And that is all he needs. That is the faith that I need. That is the faith you need. That is the faith the church of God needs. Nobody will take us for granted if we have such a faith. Faith that is able to speak in difficult situations. Faith that can make impacts in the sea. And let's round up with this. In verse 24, there arose a great tempest in the sea. So much that the sheep was covered with waves, but he was asleep. How can somebody be sleeping? I believe if you have been in a sheep in a boat and the water is being troubled, the boat is not sailing smoothly. It is being tossed to and fro, staggered like drunk men. How can somebody be sleeping in that condition? The wave is so violent that even if you were sleeping on your bed, you would be on the floor. But Christ was sleeping. And the Bible says he was fast asleep on the pillow. And the disciple came to him. That was the first time I heard Christ was sleeping. When the devil was busy, do you know what Christ was doing? He was sleeping. Because that's what the Bible said the saints should do. He said the saints should sing aloud in glory. And they should sing even while they are sleeping. Aloud on top of their bed. And that was what Christ was doing. And the high praise of the Lord make him fall asleep. On a pillow. And he was fast asleep. When the devil was busy. Raising the storm. Threatening the disciple. These disciples were not men without faith. They were men of faith. They were fishermen who has lived in the sea all their life. But they were terrified because of the wave. It was not ordinary wave. This wave tossed the sea to and fro. But there's one thing that the Bible never say happened. The ship did not break. Because why? Light lies inside the ship. And because Christ is there, nothing can happen. And that is the advice I have for you today. It doesn't matter the storm in your life. Even if you like, it takes the sheep from the ground to the top of the rock. 
it cannot break as long as God lives in you. Christians go through tough times, but tough times don't go through them. Christians go through difficult situations, but difficult situations don't go through Christians. Christians stand tough in times of trouble, but trouble don't stand tough in time of Christian. And that was what Christ wanted to teach his disciples. He was busy sleeping. Because the sea and the wave can never swallow the boat where he lies. It doesn't matter the storm. The boat would have got it to his destination. But the disciples could not get tickets. They cry out. Because when trouble becomes so much in the life of a believer, he has no other choice than to cry out. When sickness becomes so much that you cannot no longer bear it, you cry out. When affliction becomes so much in your life, you cannot no longer take it, you cry out. And he said, and the disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. We perish. That is the first time I heard the disciple of Christ use that word. Save us. We are dead. Save us. We are dead. <laughs> I thought Jesus would have jumped up. We are his trouser. I said, what, what, who is killing you? But what did he say? And he said to them, Why are you fearful? Because fear is what makes you to say you are dead when you are still alive. Fear is what makes sickness to engulf your body and you say, hey, I can never get well. Fear. is what makes you stare at a dead man and say, this man can never rise up. Fear. Fear is a limiting factor. If you want to make it to the top as Christian, you just have to learn one word, fear not. Because fear limits your ability. Fear makes a wise man foolish. And then, O oh ye of little faith. What? That is irony. Christ, if you have faith as a small, as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to Martin, be removed, be thrown into the sea. He will obey you. How dare he says to his disciple, their faith is little. Mm -hmm. They only need little faith. They don't need big faith. But something they need more than little faith. But they fear. Fear engulf the remaining faith they have. The reason why you need extra faith is to overcome fear. You can never overcome fear except you add more faith to your little faith. That's what Jesus was teaching them. And he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. All your situation today can end in a great calm. All your frustration and your sickness can end in a great calm. Only if you rise up and rebuke it. Mm -hmm. Instead of panic. Instead of hitting the panic button and putting it in hundred. You just only need to stand up. Speak to your situation. The Bible said, decree a thing and it will come to pass. And light will shine upon your ways. Mm -hmm. All you need to do tonight as we pray. Look into that situation. Visualize it in your brain and put your mind on it and speak to it and begin to speak to that situation. Take control of it. Don't let the situation control you. Just speak to it. Say situation, please be calm. Peace, be calm. Be calm. 
Sickness, hear my voice. Peace, be calm. Poverty, hear my voice. Be still and get out of my life. You annoying demons, be still and come out of that woman right now in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord is the strength of your life. There is nothing so difficult for him to do. Oh, God cannot lie. His word must surely come to pass. Brethren, I want you to hear from you. 